If I give you a compliment, can it be considered flattering, insulting, or benign? Are words capable of making someone uncomfortable or threatened? Or does the discomfort come from a more physical threat? The workplace is considered to be a safe place because many of us have to work in them. But can a misconstrued word or action be an indictment on a coworker? What is sexual harassment? Can it be defined or is every situation subject to interpretation? Sexual harassment, fact or fiction? This is Counterpoint with Gerard McClendon. Can sexual harassment be defined or do you just know it when you see it or hear it? Thank you for watching CounterPoint. Give us a call at 844-777-9311. Tweet and send Facebook comments to Gerard M. C. At the CounterPoint, we have attorney Masa Renwick from Lakeside Law Group. And we also have the one and only from Strange Ways Productions, filmmaker and talk show host, Amy Guth. Welcome ladies, welcome to the show. Thank be you. Back. Man, it's, it's, wow, I, I hate to even ask the question today, you know, with two powerful ladies who are intelligent that I'm going to get in a fight with here, but can sexual harassment be defined, all right? So I ask that facetiously, I ask it seriously, all right, which may be a little oxymoronic or ironic, but I also ask it in terms of the person who's accused of it, don't they have a defense as well? Can sexual harassment be defined? Ladies, who wants to start us off? I don't mind going first. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, sexual harassment can be defined. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is a specific definition of sexual harassment. Um, it's obviously the unwanted, um, you know, comments, acts, behaviors mm -hmm. um, towards typically a coworker because of their gender, right? Inappropriate acts, behaviors, um, towards a coworker, be, you know, because of their gender. But aside from the definition um, of sexual harassment, I think you know it when you see it, mm. right? I mean, when we work in a workplace, you can't have a thick skin, especially when you're in a field, say the legal field like I am. You can't have a thin skin when you're in, you know, rooms with the bench and the bar and you want to be accepted, you want to get along. But there's a thin line yeah. and you have to recognize when you're crossing the line, when you're the person who was harassing and you have to recognize when somebody's just joking and they're just sort of starting conversation or what have you when you are the person who's feeling, um, you know, perhaps that comments have been made that are inappropriate. Thin line, interpretation, Amy mm -hmm. Guth, I dare ask you that question with strange ways and with the documentary that you've produced and directed on women being harassed. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I give you ladies a compliment, is that harassment? If, uh, if I look at you a certain way while giving you the compliment, could that be harassment? If I look at a certain part of you while giving you a compliment, is that a harassment? The compliment may be the same, but is there a blend of action with the compliment that may make it cross into the realm of harassment? Say you what, Amy Gould? That's a very interesting, uh, you know, place to jump off because a lot of times that's the back pedal. That's the immediate back pedal. If someone says something, especially with street harassment, street harassment is a very, very big topic. What street this. harassment? Walking down the street and someone is saying something sexual to you or something unwanted otherwise. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes it can be as simple as, hey, smile, mm -hmm. like that kind of thing, yeah. right? That kind of thing. And That's harassment? Hey, smile. Certainly. Wow, okay. Because look, at the end of the day, you have the right to hold your face however you want to hold your face, oh. right? And it's all about policing women's bodies yeah. and our lives and our voices and our movements. And so it's, why, and it sets you up, right? Because if you say, why should I smile? Yeah. You're going, something very dirty is probably going to be said back to you. And if you say mm -hmm. no, the B word is coming your way, right? So they trolled you out, right. you know, and that's what a troll does, right? The troll just wants you to respond. Right, You yeah. know, hey, smile, ooh, wow. That's, that's, so that could be a form of harassment. It also could be a form of 
sexist behavior, as if you're supposed Absolutely. to smile because you're a woman. Like it's the rent you have to pay for being on the yes. planet, right? Oh. Like you have to be pretty and you have to be smiling and pleasing. And yeah. you know, that's a thing that, that yeah. I talk a lot about on the air, right? About about this idea of these standards that women are held to that, that really don't apply to men as much broadly, culturally. And I think too, um, to touch on something that, that you mentioned about the jokes, that's also an interesting point of backpedal very often. If some, somebody will say something inappropriate and cross line, well, I was just kidding. I'm just joking. I mean, we, we, we have seen this in the yeah. political landscape right now. This. <laughs> Year, right? Yeah. We've seen that very much. I was just kidding. But it's like, well, anybody can say anything really inappropriate and then backpedal by saying, I was just kidding. This is interesting because I want to ask, is it a moving target? It's in the song Addiction. I think it was on the, the album Graduation, Kanye West did a few years uh -huh. ago. He's got this interesting line in it. And it's funny because the sample is, you make me smile. And one of his lyrics is, I, I'm just asking you, but we don't have to do it unless you want to do it. So it's <laughs> like he's putting the onus on the female and making himself uh, exempt from that particular uh, harassment. So is it a moving target, Attorney Renwick? I'll say it is a moving target, but again, you know it when it's happening and you know it when you're doing it. So is it a sixth sense? Is it something that you, you're born with? Is, I mean, if, I mean, I, if somebody whistled at me, I would be like quite <laughs> flattered. But, but, but if it kept happening or ooh, maybe I wouldn't be, maybe I wouldn't be. It, it, I don't think it's a sixth sense rather. I think it's common sense. Okay, I think it's common sense, and we could not sit here um, and pinpoint every single instance of sexual harassment or sexist behavior mm -hmm. um, in the pace, place of employment, the boardrooms, the courtrooms, or what have you. But you know it when you're doing it, and you know it when you're receiving it. And so I would say, um, again, and I have to reiterate the point, you know, when you're in positions, for instance, she mentioned, you know, the, the political landscape right now, you know, when you're... Michelle Obama, and you're so highly educated and so well-trained and brilliant, right? And had such a powerful profession and position before she became the first lady, right? FLOTUS. You can't constantly, um, you know, combat the comments about your hair and about your arms and about your clothes and about your figure and so on and so forth. And a bit, in sort of a way, you have to take it in stride, right? It doesn't negate her education. Right? You have to take it a bit in stride. But at the same point in time, we have to recognize that that's only happening to her because of this sort of underlying, not even underlying, just this culture of, like she said, the rent that we have to pay in order to exist, in order to be successful, or the rent that we're expected to pay. So that's the double standard. Of Absolutely. course. Absolutely. Flotus, Absolutely. Flotus is a classic double standard yes. because men wear these boring blue suits every day with a white shirt and a tie. Women wear, don't, don't wear that, okay? And it's, and it's not like you look at a man's hair and say, oh, hair out of place. Oh, could have chosen a better tie. Oh, I bet you that suit's not Armani. But with women, it's yeah. like, knit. it's always just like jabs at women all the time. And I think that men become numb to it, and I think sometimes women become numb to it. Mm. I don't know if numb to it, or but, but maybe, get you, oh, you do, filter or, it. Or do women invite it? No. no. Come no, on no. now, ladies, Dr. because Rod. because if a woman dresses up nicely <laughs> and you don't get a compliment, now you're mad too. No. I thought no. what I had on was nice today. Why didn't someone say something about it? Oh, Gerard, you're forgetting that we dress up for ourselves. Right. Oh, really? <laughs> yes, we do. We dress up for ourselves. We don't dress up to get compliments. And our girlfriends, our sister girls, would give us compliments any day of the week. So we don't need compliments from you guys. And that's about, that, that's <laughs> about you know, if you, if you dress up and you are waiting for <laughs> external approval, that's your own issue. Yeah. I mean, you've got to leave the house and say, I'm putting my best self oh, yeah. out there. I yeah. feel my best. I look my best and do that for yourself. That's that you can't base your entire self-esteem on external validation well, in that ladies, way. I, when I when I woke up this morning, I didn't had a suit on. Now here's you what's see interesting. where I'm going with this now? Because if I know I'm staying at home, I'm not putting a suit on. So am I really pleasing myself when I go out in public and put a suit on? Or am I trying to am I trying to place some sort of an angle or 
um, um, uh, intentional influence on the people that I may run into that day. I'll say this. Okay, right now what we're talking about, I think we're actually discussing two separate issues. Mm -hmm. There are just social norms, human right. norms that cannot be undone. Mm -hmm. People trust, believe in, and will follow attractiveness any day over unattractiveness. And so there is a way that you dress when you're going out because you want to present yourself as a professional. And likewise, I, when I want to be attractive and therefore look powerful, look smart, look trustworthy, look like I'm the kind of lawyer who could take your case and do a good job, I dress in a way that's appropriate for the social norm. Across the board, even when they test little children about look at this doll and look at that doll, which one is more attractive? And therefore, they don't ask them which one is more attractive, which one is smarter, more successful, more, you know, richer. They'll go automatically in, you know, invariably towards the more attractive, mm -hmm. right? Um, and regardless the, of more how, attractive and model. And regardless of how attractive you are, that doesn't deserve harassment. Absolutely, Absolutely not. not. Yeah, yeah. Um, so rape and assault are physical, uh, yeah. somewhat obvious. Harassment can be physical, but not always. Um, it could be mental, it could be emotional, uh, it could be, uh, but can you prove that in court or to an HR director? I think that's a serious issue. And is telling the aggressor and others the best offense for a plaintiff? Do you tell the aggressor, look, I'm really uncomfortable with what you're doing and what you're saying? Do you tell that to the aggressor? Uh, and is the denial the best defense for the accused? What do you think, ladies? That's about eight questions long, George. Yes, it yeah. is. Okay. I'll let you take yeah. the first four. All right. So <laughs> I'm trying to stand up here. Seriously. Right. So, so let's kind of break that down in pieces because I do think that it is, it can be a powerful move to say, hey, that's not appropriate what you just said to me. That's not okay. That's unwelcome. And make it clear where your boundary is. It is not always possible to do that. That person could be in a position of power over you. That person could be your boss. That person could could inflict some very negative consequences if you do stand up. And so that's why you need HR departments. That's why you need something like that, that resource to go to and say, look, I'm in a really tough spot here. This is what my boss or my boss's boss or whoever is saying to me. If I say something back, I, you know, performance reviews are coming up. I know I will be punished in a way that will be hard to prove if I, if I you know, go after this, what do I do? Oh, wow. So sometimes it's very complicated. I think that's really, you know, kind of the, kind of the uh, big spot there because it's not always black and white. It's not always very cut and dry where you can just say, um, hey, absolutely not. Don't do that. Don't say that to me. I mean, I think that's always the ideal that we could be able to say that, but it's not always possible. Mm -hmm. You hold tight with me, ladies here. Does sexual harassment really exist or is this a figment of imaginations. Is sexual harassment fact or fiction? A few comments from victims. He groped me while I was setting the table, suggesting I should sit right next to him, end quote. That's Mara Smith's vice president of NSTAR Natural Gas and former intern to Clarence Thomas. Clarence Thomas says, this claim is preposterous and it never happened, end quote. Clarence Thomas, U.S. Supreme Court Justice, the source of that was the National Law Journal. Another quote, there I was standing up in front of both men. I felt humiliated and disgusted as the head of news looked me up and down as though he was inspecting a piece of meat. I knew what had just occurred was wrong. I hated myself for allowing it to occur, but she chose to focus on the fact that I got the job, even though it was clouded by feelings of blatant disrespect. I got the job. That's Janelle Miller, Source, Newsweek Magazine. We'll be back in a moment with more on sexual harassment. Tweet me, post on Instagram, or send me a message on Facebook. Let's start the conversation. Your voice is important on CounterPoint. sexual harassment fact or fiction thank you for watching counterpoint call us 844-777-9311 send me a tweet
at Gerard MC. You can also send Facebook comments to Gerard MC. Attorneys Masa Renwick and Xavier Pope join us along with filmmaker Amy Gu. Thanks so much for staying with us. Attorney Pope, thank you for joining us. You know, I was talking with the ladies in the first segment about the moving target of sexual harassment. We basically discovered that it is something that exists. That's the first thing. Yep. It can be defined. But in the sports world, you know, you host the podcast Suit Up. Mm -hmm. You're an attorney. Mm -hmm. You're a sports analyst. You know, examples of sexual harassment in the sports world. Well, the sexual harassment aspect of it in the sports realm is really more so on the sexual assault aspect. We saw the Derrick Rose case uh, that was recently wrapped up with Derrick Rose being uh, a jury saying that he did not sexually assault uh, a victim. You also have a variety of different situations. Greg Hardy, uh, that was that case as well. So sexual assault has been a really bigger issue in sports than sexual harassment. There was also a sexual discrimination case in the Major League Baseball, Frank Robinson, Hall of Famer, and in, in, in head offices of Major League Baseball, it was settled uh, a suit with a uh, former uh, head of diversity there with a woman. Uh -huh. So let's look at the legal aspect because yeah. there's these, t I'm, I'm with a filmmaker and two lawyers today, yeah. and there's the term um, innocent, which I think isn't really a legal term. It's guilty or not guilty. Yes, correct. That's correct. Okay. Uh, and so you can do something and be found not guilty. Uh, you could sexually assault someone and be found not guilty. You can harass someone and they can say, oh, man, you know, he was just kidding, you know. Come on, it, it, it wasn't for real. You know, is it that we don't take ladies seriously enough? Or when it's reversed, do we not take sexual harassment, regardless of who it happens to, regardless of gender, do we not take this subject seriously enough? I think that we've seen with the Donald Trump mm -hmm. and the release of the tape with Billy Bush and him leaving NBC, and it, it dominated the conversation in politics for about a week and a half and then it dropped off. We thought with Michelle Obama speaking and giving her speech and discussing what women go through in terms of their daily lives being harassed all day long mm -hmm. that there would be a shift in the conversation in terms of how women should be treated not only in the workplace and in their lives. Now we're talking about emails. Mm -hmm. Now we're discussing a, 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 an election and not focusing on the real important issues that women are dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, yeah, so Amy Guth, go ahead. Yeah, well, I think there's a really interesting, uh, there's a lot of places where we can really focus in on that. And one of them was in the Brock Turner case. A lot of yeah. times high-profile sexual assault cases, when we talk about the two people involved, we talk about the man's future and we talk about the woman's past. Yeah, Absolutely. We do that so very much, oh, yeah. and it's such an interesting lens to view this through that really points to a larger cultural and structural issue here. Yeah, it's yeah. if the man's future is far more important and he needs to be saved and it's <laughs> boys will be boys. Absolutely. You know, I want to read a, a quick statistic from Newsweek magazine how sexual harassment was reported to Newsweek. Type of harassment, 53 aspects, 53 percent of aspects of harassment are in the comment of jokes about sex or appearance. That's where it starts. The yeah. majority are there. Th but right after that, 18 percent is intimidation. What is intimidation as it pertains to sexual? What could be you know, perceived as intimidation? I mean, first it starts with the comments. And as um, Xavier pointed out, it's relentless when you are the only woman, one of the only women, perhaps the youngest person in the boardroom or, or, or you know, in a room with a bench in the bar or, uh, you know, in one of these old, typically old boys clubs. Mm -hmm. I mean, it starts with the relentless comments on the way that you look and sexual innuendo, yeah. right? And then it goes from there to, you know, putting you in a position where if this person is in a position of power, right, where you have to make a decision about whether or not you stand up for yourself or you keep your job. Should a person stand up for yourself in that moment? So I'm looking at the source of harassment in the other pie chart at Newsweek. It says supervisors or management mm -hmm. harassed. It was at 40 percent. And it said then after that, colleagues are at 24 percent. So what does a person do when they're harassed? Should they just nip it in the bud and say, wait a minute, I feel uncomfortable with that. I better nip this now or else it's going to perpetuate. 
I'll say this, think about, and you know, and I, I, I always hesitate to compare sort of gender inequality issues with racism because I think racism has a much more insidious and wide reaching and historical effect. But for this purpose, let's do that, compare it. It's the same as being the only black person, if you will, in the boardroom and calling somebody to the carpet about making a racist comment. If you're always the person who always has to make, because comments will continue to happen, they happen regularly. And if you are constantly the person in there agitating and letting people know that's inappropriate, well then what do they say? He plays the black card, yeah. she plays the black card. Yeah. He's so sensitive, I'm not racist, they can't take a joke. Yeah. And eventually you'll find yourself being uninvited to these important meetings and uninvited and a person non grata in, in these boardrooms. They accuse the victim of being the aggressor. Of you course. talk about Absolutely. flipping the script here. Absolutely. Amy Cool, let's talk about the film that you're doing. Uh, and you know, when you did the Kickstarter, I said, man, this is going to be phenomenal. Tell us a little bit about that because you you talk about internet trolls. You took some heat for that. I did. I took a little bit of heat. Um, the, the film is about, it's an episodic documentary about online harassment, abuse, and civility. And uh, the Kickstarter was live about 15 minutes before the first death threat came through. Wow. What's really interesting with, with online harassment, you especially see this with journalists, you especially see it in sports journalism, is, is the sexual tone it takes when it's directed at women. Mm. A lot of times, uh, you know, if, if a man and a woman are making the same point, a lot of times it's about his point. He's an idiot, I don't agree with you, da da da. For the woman, it's about, um, like immediately she's called a slut or a whore, you know, like she's called something sexual right away. It goes to about policing her body or feeling entitled to comment on it, which I think is really, really fascinating. But it plays out online in the same way. I mean, the, the online world is such a fascinating microcosm of the rest of the world, really, with this added layer of anonymity a lot of times that, that kind of makes people feel a little bit bolder yeah. to act out a bit more. Uh, there are numerous derogatory names for females in terms of body parts as well as just names in general. And you can only name a handful for men. And that, that goes back to not only misogyny, but it goes back to the, the, the hegemony of society yeah. and how uh -huh. power uh -huh. dictates everything. And unless I'm dictating the power, you know, I'm gonna make you feel bad if I don't have the power. Mm -hmm. Yeah, who are you speaking up to, right? You said nippy in a bud, but your boss's boss is more likely than not to be a guy. So there's a power element in who can you confide in. That element is all around in our society. It's pervasive, whether it's, whether it's sports journalism, whether it's media, whether it's, whether it's law, whether it's business. And that's the, the issue, is women have to confront not only the immediate harassment, but the power and structure in which they work. Yeah, I'm looking at uh, what is sexual harassment defined as unwelcome sexual advances, you mentioned this earlier, requests for sexual favors or conduct of a sexual nature, verbal, physical, visual, that's directed toward an individual because of gender. Goes on to say it can also include conduct that is not sexual in nature, but is gender related. Yes. See, I think that is really interesting. And to go off of what you were saying earlier about, about that if you are constantly the one saying, hey, that's not okay, that's not okay, that's not okay, how you start being punished for that, you Absolutely. disinvited, yeah. that sort of thing. Oftentimes, it is death by a thousand cuts. Oh, yeah. Sometimes it's not something super overt. You know, when we think of sexual harassment, we think of someone touching you, something, someone yeah. saying something sexual. Sometimes it is death by a thousand cuts. It's small comments. It's not being invited to that meeting, and you're the only woman that wasn't invited, or you know, or or, or you weren't invited because you're the woman. You know what I mean? Or it's like a little comment. I mean, I've been in a meeting before, and I said, well, you know, I don't think that that's quite how we want to angle this because of it. And someone said. Okay, Gloria Steinem. Oh, wow. really? Right? And it was really? like the room laughed, and it was like we moved on. But I was like, you know what? Hey, that was not yeah. okay. Yeah. And then by talking about it later, then there was a further kind of a punishment, a little bit of a shift yeah. in my relation, in my working relationship with that group right there. You know, yeah. we see the it says the terminology describes harassment that typically involves a supervisor giving or withholding employment benefits based on an employee's willingness to grant sexual favors. Of course, it doesn't have to be that all the time. You know, it's interesting, a few years ago, to up to this day, sports locker rooms, Xavier, yeah. always an issue. Most of the men in the locker rooms, you know, were being decent. 
Uh, but then you had this cadre of men that were like, I don't want them in here, and if they come in here, you know, whatever I say goes. Yeah. What do you think about that? Well, I think that that made an unwelcome environment for women to come into the locker room. Guys have on towels, and and because men are in, in a, I guess, quote unquote, a, a compromising position, then that disqualify women from coming into the locker room. Mm -hmm. Like they're going to, oh, now I want to jump your bones because you're half naked in the locker room, right. as opposed to doing a good job in telling a story and delivering that to the into the audience. And I think that's ridiculous because there are women's sports and men are allowed in those particular locker rooms. And, and that goes to the whole power structure mm. and be, thinking there's a certain belong, belongingness to other men. And because it's male sports, yeah. that women don't have a say in that. There is this whole sort of background theme to this election, right? We have a man versus a woman, right? And we have a very some people's opinion, misogynistic, mm -hmm. um, you know, man versus a very powerful and some might say aggressive woman, right? So it's the perfect storm to talk about these topics in the backdrop. And I would like to point out that when you talk about men locker rooms, I mean, that was something that took over, what, that comment, like you said, the comments that he made and then he likened to the comments in a men's locker room, I mean, that was shot down quickly by the athletes. Yeah. Because again, you know it when you see it. And it's not everybody. Not everybody behaves in this way. Mm. It's not acceptable to most mm. people. And so when it happens and it crosses the line, you can spot it. Just in a, in a, in a, in a statement, what do we tell young people, male or mm. female, how to basically stand up to sexual harassment? What do we tell them? I think we have to do a lot of things, but I think one of them is we have to check our own biases. When gender, race, class, all of those things, we need to check our own biases and have honest conversations. When we feel maybe our bias, our own biases are are tugging at us, mm -hmm. we need to have open conversations in workplaces. And this is why workplace diversity is so important yeah. because we, we if if every if you have a very homogenous workplace culture, mm -hmm. it's it's very difficult to be the one person always saying, hey, that's gotta change, that's gotta change, you can't say that, you can't say. What do we do to change this? Take women seriously. Take victims seriously when they report. Take them seriously when they report. It takes a lot to report and most women, most victims don't report it. So when they do, take it seriously. I wanna thank my guests for being on CounterPoint. Hey, in no way do I treat the topic of sexual harassment as a light one. Unwanted comments, insults, untoward remarks can encourage escalating harassment. But to accuse someone without justification or with a blatant lie can cause dis-ease in the workplace as well. In any case, you need to know that harassment is serious and causing someone to question your words and actions may be grounds to check your forward behavior. Harassment is about power. If you wouldn't say things to a group of people, you may want to keep those thoughts to yourself. Thank you for watching CounterPoint. Thanks to my guests. I, I need you to stay positive. Always keep your head up and be encouraged to voice your counterpoint.